Over the years, the need to improve and sustain human capital development across the world has remained a challenge in terms of achieving economic growth. Africa in the past has recorded poor health outcomes that are predated by low life expectancy and high mortality. And this has drawn the needed attention towards improving productivity through improved health outcomes. Human capital development is vital to any country's economic growth and development. Human Development Index, HDI, is a generally accepted measure of human capital development because it captures the level of education, the standard of living, and health of humans in a country. Human capital development is critical to economic growth because humans can think, analyze, and solve problems to achieve a more efficient society to yield the desired growth rates and development. The ability of a country to maximize the competitive advantage technology offers depends on human capital development. Nigeria's investment in human capital development has been described in some quarters as unimpressive. The Nigerian education sector has been receiving inadequate budgetary allocations. For instance, the education sector got an allocation of 1.29 trillion naira. That's about 7.9% out of 16.39 trillion naira in the 2021 budget. It got 771.5 billion naira, about 5.68% out of 13.58 trillion naira. And in the 2020 budget, it got 671.07 billion naira, about 6.7% out of 10.33 trillion naira. What about provisions for vocational training of young Nigerians? How can we ensure policies impact positively across key sectors of the economy, like education and health, to transform productivity to economic growth in Nigeria? This is our policy focus today. Thank you for joining us. I am Lydia Odije Ochi. Welcome back. Nigeria is immensely endowed, both in terms of human and physical resources, which are almost unquantifiable. But the country is faced with major problems like shortage of skilled labor, unemployment, poverty, and inadequate provision of health care. The National Institute for Policy and Strategic Studies, NIPS Kuru, graduated 108 participants of the Policy, Strategic and Leadership course of the Institute, PSLC. The ceremony which took place at the Unity Hall of the Institute had in attendance Professor Fumi Paramalam, MNI, Director of Studies, Mrs. Florence Adejumo, Acton Institute Librarian, and people drawn from all walks of life. While delivering a speech at the closing ceremony, Professor Paramalam acknowledged and appreciated the participants for the legacy projects. Certificates were also issued to outstanding course participants and individual project donors. Some of the participants were given the opportunity to talk about their personal course experience. Something that struck me is the attitude and the manners of the staff and the non-staff. They are cordial, very, very cordial. I was surprised that one joined in the morning, some who are older than me, better than you, better than me, passed me by and said, good morning, sir. I looked at them, I wonder. The PSLC communique was presented by the president of the PSLC 47, Mr. Chukugoze Uja. Some of the participants have this to say. Truly indeed, I want to thank the Inspector General of Police for nominating me for this policy, strategy and leadership course. It's a course that is key to the Nigerian police force because the policy, the strategies and leadership it's a cornerstone if police really want to excel to higher altitude. 
I count myself privileged to be here. I thank the school, the Institute of um, National um, Policy and Strategic Studies, and for the course that has taken us a month uh, to achieve today. It's um, very, if I will encourage every citizen of Nigeria, not just the senior executives, not just the, the managers in various organizations, private sectors and public sector. It is worth the time. It is worth. From the strategy to leadership to policy, I've come to learn new things that I never knew how to go about it. And especially the leadership course has really shaped my mind in a different way especially mentorship and succession planning. So I think what NIPS is doing here is very, very awesome. And my advice or what I would say is, I think this course should catch the youth, not when the person is about leaving work. Because if you can shape a youth's mind from the early stage, by the time they get up there, the ripple effect will make a lot of sense. What are these policies and strategies needed to aid relevant agencies and policy makers to address human capital development issues in Nigeria? Let me introduce Professor Shola Adeyonju MNI, Head, Public Affairs Department, National Institute for Policy and Strategic Studies. Thank you for finding time to join us, Prof. Thank you so much for having me. All right. Now, we're talking about human capital development. And we know it is crucial for economic growth, no doubt. But it looks like not enough attention has been given in this area. Is the challenge coming from weak policies or their implementation? Well, uh, you know, human capital development is so important to every population. Uh, when you talk about a population, any day, any time, mm -hmm. large population is an asset. But then it doesn't become an asset until you improve the quality of that population. And how do you improve the quality of the population? It's by looking at the level of education, the level of skills, the health status, and uh, other things like that. That is what you use to look at uh, human capital development. But talking about policy, the problem we have been having is that uh, many people look at human capital development from only maybe uh, empowerment perspective. But it's not just about empowerment perspective. And that is why we do things like uh, uh, somebody will say, I want to empower you, buy a pep or buy a motorcycle. Not that it is bad on its own, mm -hmm. but it's not a holistic about human capital development. Mm -hmm. So what we need to do is to see how our policies can be talking to themselves mm -hmm. so that there will be a sort of coordination and synergy on policies that are aimed at human capital development. For now, it seems we are still working in silos. Now, would you say we are developing the kind of human capital that can aid our economic growth? Well, you see, uh, we say Nigeria is over 200 million. Some say 220, some say 210. But whatever it is, the fact is that we are over 200 million. And if that is the case, we should be bothered about the quality of that population so that we can turn that into an asset. And uh, luckily for us in Nigeria, we have what we call the youth budge, where over 50% of the population is youth, mm -hmm. young people. And that is a very big asset uh, to us as a people. But then, as I said, if you want to know whether we are developing human capital the way we are supposed to be doing, there are indices that you look at, and the first of them is education. If you look at education, what exactly is happening at our educational level, right from nursery school to primary school to basic education to uh, tertiary institution, these are things that when you look at them, and if you look at it critically, you will agree with me that we still have some problems in those areas. Mm -hmm. And that is to tell us that we cannot say that we are developing human capital development. Then if you talk to health, when you look at health and you look at the indices that should be there in health, 
you look at mortality rate, you look at fertility rate, you look at uh, um, uh, expectancy, age expectancy, or death expectancy, and other things like that. When you look at some of these factors and you compare them with what you have, maybe around the world or average for Africa, you'll be able to know whether we are doing well or not. And the yeah. verdict is that we are actually not doing well enough. Okay. Now, what is the nexus between population growth and human capital development? I just finished talking about population, mm -hmm. that a population is an asset. Mm -hmm. But it doesn't become an asset for a nation. It can, be, it can become a liability mm. if the quality of the population in terms of human capital development is low. It is only when it is high that you can be proud mm -hmm. to say this is our population. If, over, if your unemployment rate is over 40% and above, then it means that there are people in the system that are not engaged in productive activities. And it means that it is only those who are engaged in productive activities that will be feeding those who are not engaged mm. in the productive uh, activities. And if you look, want to talk about the issue of statistics, when you look at it very well, you see that life expectancy in Nigeria is about 55, roughly 55 years. That is very low. Very, very I low. mean, if you cannot have life expectancy of 70 mm -hmm. and above, mm -hmm. it means that there is a problem. So 55 point something is not uh, something that you would expect a population like Nigeria to have. And that is to say that we have a little problem. Birth rate is on the high. In fact, our population is growing at the average, average of 2.6%. Now, growing of the population is not the problem. The problem is that population that is growing, what quality do they have? Mm -hmm. The young people who are supposed to be productive in the system, they are less engaged. Mm -hmm. And that is one of the crux of the matter. That is talking about population. Then, when you look at health and you look at education, mm -hmm. which are prime to human capital development, mm -hmm. you look at skills acquisition, you look at so many other areas, you see that we still have some problems on how to harness this population to be able to, if, if you look at it, for instance, human capital development is, does not happen by chance. Mm. It has to be done deliberately, planned, implement, I mean, planned and implemented deliberately. And what are you going to be looking at? Maybe four basic areas. First is, you use that to improve the knowledge of the population. What constitutes, mm. and when I say knowledge, I'm not just talking about uh, education, tertiary education, I mean, formal education. Mm -hmm. Knowledge generally, what quantity of knowledge do you have within the society, including social knowledge mm -hmm. of how to interact, the values to hold, and things like that. Those are part of the knowledge. Mm -hmm. You also need to look at this level of skills that the population has. Because it's only skills that will make you to be productive. Yes. Now, have we improved on the skills? And then uh, we'll be looking at uh, also, also our values and how you encourage the right behavior. Mm -hmm. Now, talking about our values, you see that when you have the right kind of attitude mm -hmm. and values, you are likely to be more productive. Mm -hmm. This is an area we have not been looking at very critically, and it is very important. <laughs> when you go to the, the issue of um, health, and you look at the indices, you start asking yourself, for instance, you say average spending on health, which they call out-of-pocket expenses. Mm -hmm. It's about 74.7%. And that is one of the highest in the world. It's not the highest, but one of the highest in the world. When you look at African average, you have something like 31%, mm -hmm. which means that we are even more double. So if individuals will spend substantial part of their earnings on health, health. Then you are already having a problem. That is those who are even employed who can even mm -hmm. have access to money. What about those who are unemployed? So these are part of the problem. Mm -hmm. And the same thing with education. Mm -hmm. The problem with our educational sector, which we may need to look at into critically, uh, asking about human capital development, is that you will discover that we have intervention funds mm -hmm. at our educational level, meaning that we feel that they are not getting enough funding. Let's intervene and let's upgrade it. You have what you call UBEC, Universal Basic, yes. Basic Education mm -hmm. uh, Commission. They have a fund which is in partnership between federal government and the state government. Now, that is targeted at basic education. Mm -hmm. And basic education is your education from uh, nursery up to mm -hmm. junior secondary school. Mm -hmm. So you have senior secondary school and you have uh, 
We also have what we call a uh, uh, tech fund for tertiary institutions, polytechnics, and uh, universities, mm -hmm. probably also covering colleges of education. Mm -hmm. But then, one of the most critical areas that is important for our human capital development, mm -hmm. which is the, what they call TVET, uh, te technical and vocational education, mm -hmm. TVET is area where we have neglected. In any mm -hmm. case, there is no special intervention fund for that area, and we have, okay. been, we have neglected it over the years. This is the middle level area where technicians will be produced to support scientists. Mm. And if the scientists, engineers, and co are doing their stuff, and they don't have that level, that mini, uh, middle cadre level, then you see that we have a problem okay. in our human capital development. Yes. That is why you see that those with skills are becoming scanty by the day. When you talk about building, for mm. instance, you have a situation where Nigerians are now saying, let's go to Togo to get those who are going to tile our floors. Or, 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 let's, go to, or let's go to Ghana for POP. POP. So we are our own skills. We are our experts because that middle cadre has been neglected. Mm. Wow. Thank you for that, Prof. Now, let, let us now examine policies in the area of investment in human capital development. What will be your assessment? Well, you see, part of the investment is you look at your, you look at your budget. Mm. What is the percentage of budget on education? Yes. What is the percentage of budget on health? And you'll see that, well, we have security, which is prime, mm -hmm. taking the bulk of the budget. Then you start talking about agriculture and other things. Now, health and education is not given that prime of place. And uh, if that is the case, these are things that will affect our human capital development. Mm -hmm. Because it is when people are healthy that they can be productive. And it's when they are educated that they can deliver. Mm -hmm. So they go hand in hand. And this is uh, one of the uh, problems that we have had. And of course, I must say this at this point, that the National Institute has actually gone to do a lot of studies. In the year 2020, uh, the theme for that year, which they conducted research on, is human capital development. I mean, uh, population growth and human capital development. In other words, how are you going to harness your population growth through the improvement in human capital development to make the system more productive mm -hmm. so that we can be self-sufficient and so that we can start manufacturing? And uh, I must say that a lot of recommendations and implementation strategies came out of that. Uh, some governments are uh, looking into, some are neglected. Mm. Okay, now, Prof, in what ways can human capital be improved over time through either f informal or formal sk uh, skill acquisition? You see, we, we have some informal sectors mm -hmm. that are helping to fill the gap, only that it may not be because it is not planned, okay. not properly planned. Of course, many people have talked mm -hmm. about the apprenticeship uh, yes. system predominantly in the, north, uh, in the uh, southeast, mm -hmm. which is probably extending to other areas gradually. Mm -hmm. But you see that that is informal. It is good, but it has not been proper. It, many people have studied it. There are a lot of studies on it, on how we should okay. harness it. But we don't seem to have been able to do that. That mm -hmm. is one. Mm -hmm. I also know that people do a lot of apprenticeship in styling, in um, um, what they call it, um, um, styling the of air by okay, women, okay. tailoring, carpentry. People do it in an informal way, but you will see the difference between somebody, for instance, who has gone to a technical education, a technical college, mm -hmm. and somebody who has just learned it by the and roadside. Uh, the difference is that there will be some level of finesse in okay, their product. Okay. It is not yeah. just necessarily that those at the roadside don't know what they are doing. But when you look at one of the things that affect us most is our finishing. And that finishing is what you put to fine tune whatever skills that you have. And if you don't do this, you, there is no how you are going to be competing with your counterparts from other Outside countries. Okay. And that is the problem. And you see that once you have professionals within our system, mm -hmm. the next thing is that because it is easier for them to make it outside, is to start getting outside the country. But Prof, but, but Prof, uh, sometimes you see some of our finished products, for example, those that come out from ABBA, you would actually think they were made outside the country. Yeah. 
So we have to. No, we know we we are not saying that it doesn't exist, yeah. but can we say that it's all over? That is the problem. If, for instance, you you know about products are mostly material things like mm, uh, maybe shoes, shoes belts, and other things suits, like that. Even suits, suits, clothes. Yeah. Now, when it comes to building, for instance, mm -hmm. you want uh, a mason mm. that will do a perfect job. We have them, but they are, they are on the decline now. Mm. Uh, you want uh, somebody who can do ceiling, you want somebody to roof. Not that we don't have those people, mm. but we don't have them in, at the level at which they are needed. Mm -hmm. You can imagine people without skills looking for jobs. And I'm sure many will want to acquire the skill. Mm -hmm. Of course, you have skill acquisition centers here and there, mm -hmm. you know, scattered everywhere. But, and even you have a, a national board for technical education mm -hmm. that is seen to how that education is done. But we are still not where we are supposed to be. Go to many of our technical colleges and see the level of resources that are available there. And at the pace which technology is going, mm. nobody is going to wait for us. We just need to equip those places, get our people to be skilled, and then so that they can mm -hmm. return and be more productive to the system. Now, there, there, are, there have been several social investment initiatives mm -hmm. in Nigeria aimed at enhancing productivity or productive capacities of labor. How effective or result-oriented have they been so far? Well, you know, at the point we started with what they call ND, yeah. National Directorate yes. of uh, yeah. Employment. Employment. I remember vividly when we were doing that ND, both formal and informal sector. Mm -hmm. They say, okay, you want to learn dying. They attach you to either an institution or somebody who is very good at it. People register, mm -hmm. and they attach you, and government pays you some stipend uh, every month just to keep you there so that you learn. And after you finish, mm -hmm. they give you some uh, takeoff grants and things like that. That fizzled out with time. Now, we still have, I believe we still have National Directorate of Employment, mm -hmm. but how functional is it? When you go there, you see that they are staffed of funds. Now, rather than use the institutional frameworks, mm -hmm. We started using programs. We have many programs. We have uh, NAPEP. Mm. We have all sorts of programs located here and there. Mm -hmm. Some in an, an office, mm. some in a ministry. Now, there is no problem with that. They were like uh, just top gap. They are not really solving the problem the way it should be solved. So I think what we need to do is to find a way of getting a well-coordinated thing. I am ob I am, I'm not oblivious of the fact that the federal government and the state government are involved and they have to be on the same page for mm. this to work. Mm. But then, when this one is well organized, then the National Council on Education, for mm. instance, can start meeting and say, look, how do we coordinate this mm. so that we'll be on the same page. page? And then how do we devolve a national policy to the states since we are working towards the same thing? Mm -hmm. Not that one state will be working on its own in silo and then the federal is working in another silo. So we need some level of synergy and coordination okay. to get this in place. Okay, now let's talk about uh, budgetary allocations to the health and educational sector. What would be your recommendations? Well, uh, you know, there is this uh, figure that mm. we bandied around that UNESCO said mm. that uh, you must have uh, like 25%, I think, of your budget for education. Mm -hmm. Even though our research has shown that it was not as if uh, that was actually mm -hmm. uh, a recommendation mm -hmm. from UNESCO or yeah. from whatever. But then, the idea is that there has never been any time we have up to 10% of our budget allocated to education or to health. And then you see it will be overing around 7%, 8%, 9%, and things like that. But these are very fundamental. Mm -hmm. Fundamental in the sense that whatever you are going to achieve as a nation, you need the population as an asset. Mm. I, as an asset, as I said earlier on, is that when they have the, what it takes to be productive, you cannot afford to have a over 50% young people in your population, and they are idle. Mm. You are going to spend more money to curtail the evil that they, they will yes. be perpetrating <laughs> than to train them. Okay. And that is, I think, that's why we need a paradigm shift along that line. 
we need to be able to harness that resources. And we should, yeah, it's not as if it is bad. Some people are saying, anyway, when you travel, mm -hmm. you go and acquire skill and come back home mm -hmm. and uh, employ. But we should know that most of those places that our children are traveling to are populations that are aging. Yes. They are aging and they, they want young population mm -hmm. that will come and help them prop up whatever productivity level is lacking in their society. So it is like we are now building resources for them. Mm -hmm. Not just raw materials this time around, even human resources. We build human resources, our young people will go there. They go there and go and service their system. So when are we going to service our own system? I think that is what we should be bothered more about. Uh, Prof, we'd like you to share your opinion on policies that you consider weak and those you consider strong. Maybe I will take a cue from uh, <coughs> the study from NIPS, okay. which uh, led to some recommendations. And uh, you know, as we say in NIPS, recommendations and implementation mm -hmm. strategies. In other words, uh, we, we don't just give you recommendations, we also give you the leeway mm -hmm. or the means of achieving that recommendation. Uh, one of the things that we looked at is that our planning would need to be more uh, precise. And how do I mean? We cannot, even though estimation, some people argue that estimation of population can also be accurate. But then, within that, people still know that intermittently, you need to be conducting your population census, mm -hmm. which we have not done for quite some time. Mm. I think the last one was 2006. Ordinarily, it shouldn't be more than 10 years mm -hmm. or maximum 15 years. Some do it 10 years, some do it 15 years. Mm -hmm. So that from time to time, because your social, uh, so, uh, social data mm -hmm. might have changed. Mm -hmm. So we need to conduct our national population census. Mm -hmm. Yes, I know the idea was mooted. We were almost doing it last year. Mm -hmm. But at the end of the day, uh, it has not seen the light of day. I think if we are going to move forward, the current government will have to take a very good look at how we can do our population census. It is not just to know the number of people. It is about planning. It's about knowing the composition. It's about knowing who lives where. Mm. So this, all this will lead to our economic planning, our health planning, mm. education planning. All those sectors will be influenced and because we need data for planning. So now, population census is a means of acquiring data. Of course, there's some we argue with you that where we keep on updating the data. Mm -hmm. But we, me and you, we know that, uh, that, that it is not where it should be. Our data should be on our fingertips mm -hmm. as ev at every point in time so that we can use it for planning. Mm -hmm. So that is number one aspect, mm -hmm. which I think we are lacking. Uh, we need to conduct our population uh, census. That is one. Secondly, is that uh, we need, uh, recently there was uh, the, the enactment of the National Health Insurance Scheme Regulatory uh, Act, I mean, which has been passed. The idea is that all the states should be able to key into National Health Insurance Scheme, mm -hmm. and it should be broader to cover more people. But we need to pursue the implementation of this. Because, as I said earlier on, out-of-pocket expenses is very high. And that is impacting on whatever income the household is having. Mm -hmm. And if that impacts on the national income, for instance, what percentage of your health do you pay from your pocket? What percentage do you get from the public mm -hmm. system? So if it is 74.7%, mm -hmm. that alone can take away the income of low-income earners. Even the high-income earners will feel it. Yes. And uh, you could see, that is the more reason why we are talking about medical tourism. Mm. People go out mm. to go and seek medical help. Most of those people who are doing medical tourism are paying from their pockets. So if we can f uh, fully implement the National Health Insurance Scheme and we can expand its coverage, mm. then we will have done a lot of good to the health sector and that will be a big relief to us as a, as a, as a people. Mm -hmm. Another thing I'll need to mention before I move on is that we need 
to also re redirect our medical uh, philosophy from curative to preventive. Because, as they said, that prevention is better than cure. Most of what we do now is to, uh, to be curative in nature. You already have the disease, then we are looking for how to cure, cure it. it. But what we should be doing is preventing it from even happening in the first instance. Mm -hmm. And that would demand a lot of concerted efforts, uh, uh, coordinated efforts. Uh, I know there are institutions that are saddled with this, mm -hmm. but we want to see it happening that we are paying more attention to preventive uh, medicine than curative mm -hmm. uh, medicine. Uh, that is on, on, on that aspect. Mm -hmm. oh, I also uh, think one very important point before we move on mm -hmm. is that we need to do everything that we needed to do to reduce the out-of-school children. Mm. For now, we have papers to tell you we have 10 million, 11 million children out of school. Some people will even tell you it's a lie. It's not up to that. But whether the figures are correct or incorrect, the truth of the matter is that we have very high out of school children. Mm -hmm. And if you have that, what are you building for the mm. society? What do you want them to become? How do they self actualize themselves? So we need that to make sure that not just that people go to school, but that people will have something to do mm -hmm. after school. Yeah, there is no doubt that the current government has been taking steps. Mm -hmm. Like uh, you, you see a situation where we talked about the education bank, mm -hmm. that we should, I mean, uh, we should revive the education bank. Mm -hmm. Now, that of education bank was announced some time ago, but uh, I, I think it's, the announcement was not holistic enough. We want to see a situation where this education bank will take off, and then we can be guaranteed that access to education will increase. Mm -hmm. And then uh, when you now produce, it's not just to produce people. Of course, that will give us enough room to, for people to have access. But we should be thinking of what to do after mm -hmm. the access to education. You cannot have graduates who are roaming the streets, mm. who want to do something but cannot get what to do. And you say there should not be increase in crime. So because it's a chain reaction. Definitely. Uh, when you have, when you start hearing some things around the country now, like a 17 year old going to do money ritual, then you shudder. You start wondering, what are we building? Mm. What kind of youth are we bringing up in the society? How is it going to impact on us in the next five, ten years when technology must have left us behind? Mm. So we need to think about all this very well. Thank you, Prof, for sharing your thoughts with us on human capital development. We appreciate your time. It is my pleasure. Thank you very much. We've been talking to Professor Shola Adeyonju, MNI, Head, Public Affairs Department, NIPS. Let's take a break. We'll be right back. Stay with us. Keep watching. Keep watching. Keep watching NIPS Policy TV. graduated from the university, I never looked for any job to, to do for the government. I have been on my own together with my husband. We've been on our own trying to source our means of livelihood. So we've been, we've been working hard to see how we can create job opportunities for the youth. And I advise the youth to, to look for we, we are so blessed in Nigeria. We have a lot of resources that we can leverage on. Instead of selling our farm produce raw, we can add value to it and sell them. We must not be selling it to the uh, international folks uh, unprocessed. We have, we, have to, we have to be creative. And the, for the government, what I advise the government to do is to accelerate the entrepreneurs. Let them look at the entrepreneurs that are working hard and see how they can boost us to boost the economy. Because we are, whether you like it or not, the entrepreneurs are the ones that will kickstart the revolution of this country. We are the ones that will take this country to the next level. So the government should look into how they can 
send, help us with machines because our challenges are machines, mechanized um, machines that we we'll use to process our products. So the government should look into how they will get us machines, how they can pro 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 um, provide us with space that will work comfortably and pro add value to our products. Well, yes, like I said, um, we have quite a number of parastatals that are doing that, like the Bank of Industry. I just recently came back from Lagos Business School, fully sponsored by Bank of Industry, thanks to them. They sponsored me for six weeks program, and we went, it's an accelerator program, and it was very rich and educating. They, they sponsored us, to, uh, um, taught us how to move to the next level, teach us strategies, taught us management, taught us a lot of things on how to move our business to the next level. So the government should do more of that by funding the, the organizations responsible, like Bank of Industry. In Plateau State, we have Plasmida, who are responsible for the M MSMEs. So they should, they should fund them and give them access to, to funds where they can accelerate the MSMEs and help them to boost their business and see how they can assist us to export our products. Because we have products, very good and well-processed products. We have certifications, but we don't have we don't have uh, international markets. So we need, we need, we need, we can't produce the product and then keep them in the, at, at home. We need the market. And so I think the government should help us in boosting the um, parastatals responsible for that. The government they don't used to give everybody hope. Normally all over the world, there is no country they can give 100% employment. But what we need from our government is just to create an enable environment so that more investors will come and invest money. That's the only thing we need from our government. Then they will give us security, education. So when we have this one, this unemployment is going to be history. And I don't need much to, to get employed. The only thing they need is employment. Uh, the only thing they need uh, only, is just a little bit something they need to. Let's assume. Let's assume for um, even you know that our security they contributed in this insecurity that we are having. Our security, I will always say they are contributing to this insecurity we have. Let's assume. Okay, let me give you one example. My reason. One example. Let's assume. Uh, this uh, bike, that's this, we used to call it in lo our local language, Okada. Okay, say we we'll stop Okada. And you do not give that Okada man a job to do. And do you know how it takes to get that money to buy that Okada? You don't know. So when you collect that thing, what do you expect for him? To go and steal? To go and join higher uh, arm robbers? or to go and join tourism group. In Plateau State, crisis take place for about, let's say, 10 years. Crisis is taking place. So after the crisis, what did the government did in order to rehabilitate the people, to make the people, okay, let's sit down and, okay, individual person, okay, come to, come to me. Like example, let me give you one example with me. Sometimes if I sit down and wonder, Okay, when there was crisis in 2001, we have shop in Terminus. They burn our shop in Terminus. They burn Terminus market. So we are seeing our shop. It's not fire. It's not yet to their place. So we are we are begging the security that she please allow us to open and take even only a bag because we finish sell today. Like tomorrow morning, we are going to take the sales to the bank. So we didn't even finish. This thing happened. How will you cope? What did the government do to us as an individual? Like, a, I'm a citizen of Nigeria. What did the government do to me? So that tomorrow, if I see something, I will try and prevent it. But if not mindset, I will not do. But I love my country, and I want 
all these things to stop. This issue of skills and acquisition should be introduced into the sector, into the secondary school level. I think by doing that, uh, it will encourage the youth to you know, have what is, uh, is expected of them. When you are still young and you have something doing, even if you do not go to the tertiary institution, at least we have some, we have uh, uh, the radio mechanics and the rest of them. Some are photographers, like myself, I'm a photographer. And I'm also a... Before it gets into any agreement, it should know such itself and know if it has the financial capability to carry through with that arrangement so that it will not have to default you know, in future. I think what the lecturers were asking when they were going on strike is again, considering the set of things in the country. So you wouldn't blame them because all of us go to the same market. We are having graduate of undergraduate, graduate of undergraduate. But when it comes to employment, you will finish your school with your good results, your performance and everything. You will run this country. You will go places to places. You will never find any organization that is looking for work. The reason is that most of these our parents who are old enough to, to, to rest from their studies, but they will rather reduce their ages from 70 to 30. And the, the, the younger ones that were just coming, we are there fighting for offices with them, which is not supposed to be like that. Keep watching. Keep watching. Keep watching NIPS Policy TV. The National Institute for Policy and Strategic Studies, Kuru, inaugurated a series of lectures for alumni of the Institute. In his opening address, Director General of the Institute, Professor Ayo Omotayo, emphasized on the importance of the lecture series, which he said will expand the knowledge of the participants in today's world where government policies are crucial. This is of utmost importance if you are to maintain our stance as the nation's foremost think tank. Let me start by commending the Directorate of Studies and particularly the committee that worked hard to put together this program. The lecture series, which had resource persons, was divided into governance, strategic, leadership, economy and security. The lead resource person gave insight on democracy being dependent largely on numbers and population. The government and relevant stakeholders were admonished to avoid disenfranchisement of members of the society, especially youths, women, and people living with disability. Today, our guest on Alumni Chat is Professor Liu Fua, MNI. He is a professor of political science with emphasis on international relations, and he is a certified international scholar. And he is a directing staff here at the National Institute for Policy and Strategic Studies. Thank you for joining us, Prof. 
We're glad to have you, and we thank you for finding time to talk with us. You're welcome. Okay, Prof. Okay, now, Prof. What was your experience when you were here for the senior executive course? Wow, that's a long time ago. Uh, I came into the National Institute precisely February 1st, 2001. And in 2005, I had grown to be an associate professor, and I was nominated by then President Olusegun Obasanjo. Uh, I will certify some of the requirement the president thought was good for the National Institute. And at the age below 40, he instituted that I be nominated. And I was nominated in 2005, as that cost 27. And since then, it has been wonderful. Being a participant at that time was something, I was about the second person in the National Institute to be nominated after uh, the late uh, Adebi, the librarian of the National Institute. And it was like uh, homecoming because then I was uh, at the, Nash uh, the Defense Academy. I met late Joe Galba, the then DG, and he asked that I be sent to this institute. Not as if I applied then, but he found we argued on certain things in the UK. As a scholar, he asked, and I said, I am ready to come down here. And so when I came, and after the nomination, it was like the beginning for me. I was then supposed to be the coordinator of the National Institute. But unfortunately, Yugaba passed on six months after my coming in here. Yeah, of blessed memory. And I moved on to, to be a senior fellow and uh, proudly uh, an MNI. Proudly so. Yes, proudly so an MNI. And uh, from then it was something I lost and something I was happy about. But that didn't stop me from all these issues, I wasn't too proud about it. I felt it was a privilege for somebody like me to be nominated while a lot of people across the country are looking for this prestigious MI. Okay. And that gingered me up. Okay. Prof, it's quite clear that you've gained a whole lot of experience. Now, how has the experience imparted on your person and your career? Honestly, I would tell you it was something wonderful. Anywhere I enter, the, the mere sight of the badge makes you look unique. The mere sight of the badge makes you look unique. And it opened my life up. I started uh, being called everywhere to talk. The NTA had been one of, the NTA International has been one of my, my best, uh, what do I call it, at that time, platform. platform. Each now and then, national issues come up. I was invited to chat on certain issues, on national issues, on international issues. And uh, I won't tell you that uh, I'm not happy today. I have not seen what they call poverty in the classroom. You know, once they say you're a teacher, sometimes they see you as somebody who is not, uh, who is just like that. And I started changing the image of even being a professor too, to show the world that look, I have something to, to give. And I've imparted life. And the, uh, what makes me uh, so happy today is that since 2005, to this day, I have impacted the little that I have to how many sets today behind me. Today, I'm, I'm talking about 23 years or so. And I think you're the oldest. I'm, I'm the oldest here because I'm cost 27. And everybody that is in NIPS today, except for 
one uh, uh, barrister man who is cost uh, who she is cost 17 and I, I get happy but as a staff here I'm the oldest staff and also the oldest MNI and I impacted on even the MNIs that are now directing staff they were all my students and uh, since then things have been so well and so perfect that uh, I just pray that uh, we continue to impact knowledge and to impact what we have, what we have been given, because you cannot give what you don't have. So I have moved from there to become a vice chancellor of Bingham University from 2013 to 2018, January. And uh, proudly so, brought up students. I moved on there today everywhere in the world. I'm a, I'm a global professor, not, not, uh, not a national one, everywhere today. What is your philosophy of life? Well, my philosophy of life is uh, I don't fear fear, but I fear regrets. What I can do if I don't do it today, tomorrow it may hurt me. So the idea is that I don't fear fear, but I fear regrets. That I don't give you what you need now. I feel tomorrow will be too bad for me if I reflect and I see that I didn't do the right thing. So that had motivated me in all my doings. And the philosophy in life is that I should keep walking while it's day. Because when the night comes, I can't walk again. So I give what I have today. And I'm proudly so uh, humble to say that uh, if I see a participant that is an average person, I try to encourage. I try to put in more force in seeing that that person becomes who he is. I don't want to see somebody lagging behind. This is the philosophy of life I have. What would be your take on the narrative that the ANI or the alumni is an elitist group? This is a wonderful question. I, I don't want to see it in a bad manner, but I want to believe that since its inception to some 45 years ago, we had the number, I'm not sure we are beyond, we are up to 2,500 as of count now. So it make, makes that an elitist group. But the elitist group is that what we have imparted on people wherever we find ourselves makes us a complete, uh, how do I describe it? Uh, a class of elites that impact knowledge. Not a, in, uh, not a class of elites that sits down to, to just distort whatever comes in. They call them guru mafia. I've not seen the mafia in it, but I've seen uh, some way of imparting uh, some knowledge. That is just what I would say. Thank you, Professor Liu Fua, MNI. Thank you for sharing your thoughts. We really appreciate your time with us. We hope next time we come to you to talk about national issues, you avail us your time. Thank you indeed. Thank you, thank you very much. You're, You're welcome. welcome. Thank you for watching Alumni Chat. Stay with us, there's still more on the program. Economic growth is one of the most important indicators of a healthy economy, which has been regarded as sine qua non for achieving macroeconomic objectives. Over the years, Several studies have emerged to provide quantitative evidence to the effects of human capital development on economic growth in Nigeria.